So the, the main thing that I've been doing for, for Sir 3 d aside from sort of supporting Joe and, and the research that he's been doing that he presented yesterday, um, is I've been sort of acquiring the new XRD, the new diffractometer, as well as adapting the, the current hot uniaxial press, which was bought on a different grant um, for making these, these IR transparent ceramics. So hopefully this is kind of familiar to all of you, but I thought I'd put it in because I know we've got quite a wide range of uh, areas of speciality. Um, extra diffraction, we can look at Bragg's law, we have in theory monochromatic x-rays, you diffract off planes and a particular angle theta. And so for a single crystal, you get all these spots. And then for a powder, you end up with cones. And if we run a detector from a low angle relative to the incident beam to a high angle in two theta, we end up with a nice diffraction pattern that you can see on the bottom. Um, and so just from simple Bragg-Brentano measurements, which is just a way of setting up the diffractometer, we can get quite a lot of information on what's in the sample. The, the main thing that's probably the most common is phase analysis, so what crystalline phases are actually present in the material. Um, and this is generally done by just matching to standard databases. There's a whole this field of study called rebar refinements, which are necessary for, for more in-depth analysis, but you know, definitely possible from lab data. And this is looking at stuff like the determination of the unit cell parameters. So what has happened to the unit cell when we dope in some serum into yttria or vice versa. The quantitative phase analysis, so how much of each phase is, is present. If we haven't doped it all in fully and we've got some seria remaining, how much seria is left versus how much yttria is left. As well as some more in-depth structural analysis. Uh, really quite demanding in terms of the data you need. You can get a lot of information on the structure of the material just from laboratory data. And in, in this project, in terms of the, the uh, transparent windows, we're specifically interested in the high temperature behavior of materials. So the, the new XRD has been delivered, it's been installed. Um, the engineer from Rigaku has sort of done all the unpacking and installation. Um, and I, I don't know whether he's, he's trained Phil yet, but it's sometime this week, we'll train Phil just on the real basic you know, operation turning on and off, what order of operations these need to be done in. And we're waiting for uh, some application engineer Rigaku to come and, and give us a real in depth. Uh, lesson on how to do all the things that I'm going to talk about on this instrument. So in terms of the capabilities, we have just basic Brentano divergent beam measurements. So with a, a sample changer, this means we can, you know, set and forget 10 samples, come out the next morning, and we'll have nice diffraction patterns ready for analysis. Um, the, the stuff that's specific to this diffractometer, this kind of when we bought it, is we have uh, sort of two separate attachments or two separate families of measurements we're going to do. So we have a layering cradle that goes along with uh, parallel beam optics, which can be switched just by computer. So you don't have to you know, get inside a different computer enclosure and change all these things. And this is good for principal measurements or orientation control figures and stress measurements. And I'm looking at the and we also have the high temperature which is essentially just a furnace with sort of extra transparent windows that goes up to 1500 degrees C in air or inert or vacuum atmospheres. So I'll, I'll talk about the high temperature XRD first. Um, one of the things that we're going to be most interested in this is, is phase transitions. So many of these rare earth sesquioxides oxides have two, sometimes three, sometimes four phases at different temperatures. Um, and obviously, if, if there's such a big change in, in density and structure as a function of temperature, the window isn't going to survive. Um, so we can look at this is just some, some examples I thought off the top of my head. So how does the doping of, I don't know, cerium into europium affect the phase transition temperature? Can we prevent the unwanted transition? Especially if we're looking at cubing materials for their optical properties because they're isotropic. Um, can we prevent it from going to the monoclinic polymorph as temperature increases? And there's some other more interesting stuff, some more in-depth stuff, I should say, looking at displacive versus reconstructive phase transitions, as well as kinetics and thermodynamics. If the phase transition happens very slowly, it's kind of less of a problem than if it happens very rapidly at the temperatures we're going to be looking at. 
And you can do some other stuff. You can look at reaction progress as a function of time, at a set temperature, or a function of temperature at set times, as well as looking at the thermal expansion coefficient. So this is the microscopic thermal expansion coefficient. It doesn't account for grain boundaries or any of the microstructure, but it still gives us a good idea of, of how the material is going to change with temperature. So texture measurements, we've got the parallel beam optics, the Eulerian cradle, which is a three axis cradle, so you can present at any angle to the beam. And this is what we can do with press measurements and look at the text. Um, so of interest to us is going to be if we, on purpose, just as a result of the cooling during hot pressing, which I'll talk about shortly, we can quantify the amount of stress that's residual in that pellet. And we could do that, you know, ex situ, possibly in situ, but um, yeah, we can we can compare, for example, cooling rates after processing during processing. And we can get to the texture. This tells you about the grain orientations of a monolith. Um, and obviously, of interest to us is going to be if you're pressing something with a uniaxial pressure, do the grain somehow align in that axis? versus pressure the center is going to be different and has been different at different locations whether it's close to the die in the bulk close to the edge of the pellet so there's quite a lot of information we can get from this and a lot of a lot of really interesting science we can do um, even just on these quite simple rare earth oxides i um, mentioned that joe yesterday gave a presentation of sort of the actual characterization here's just a picture of some some of the materials that he's prepared um, but I guess as a, as a lead into talking about the press, the transparency of these ceramics is, is chiefly controlled by microstructure. So that's pores and grain boundaries. If we can get the high, the density up, get very high densities, that removes the porosity. And there's always going to be grain boundaries, but we can control the impact they have. For example, larger grain sizes reduces the number of boundaries, but does decrease the, the mechanical integrity of the uh, and there's a, some, some impact on the grain size distribution. And there's a lot of work that, that's ongoing with, with Joe and, and Sam talking about, you know, particle size, morphology, the processing conditions, the temperature, time, and pressure. But really we need to go from powder or a range of powders to something that looks like these. So I just thought I'd, I'd give my mind some of the sintering methods and we have two of these available to us at the moment. So pressureless sintering, just make a pellet in some way, it could be cold uniaxially pressed, cold isostatically pressed, and then you put it in a, in a furnace, in air or in, or in, or in vacuum. And then the sort of next logical step would be, can we have a furnace with a, a hydraulic press in? So that's essentially the hot uniaxial press that, that we have, which has been using quite extensively in his work. As well as a few other things that may or may not be of interest in the future. So there's hot isostatic pressing, which is where you apply pressure with the gas within a furnace, within a pressure vessel. And SPS, sometimes called FAST, or there's a lot of different acronyms for it, which is essentially hydraulic. Instead of with a furnace, just by pushing a huge amount of current through the material, or sometimes the dye. Depending on the conductivity of the material. And micro sintering is kind of an up and coming very fast method of sintering where you heat using microwave dielectric couplers. So the whole union actual press uh, we, we have, this was purchased under uh, the ARPA-E project that I work on, um, but it's been used a lot. So this gives us a simultaneous application of heat and pressure, and it's got a tungsten mesh furnace and all the other sort of hardware is either metallic or graphite. So this does exert a significantly reducing environment and does need to be um, be the high vacuum or high purity in air atmospheres to prevent oxidation of the furnace. But this means we've got this goes up to 2,000 degrees C, up to 10 tons of pressure, up to 10 tons of force, I should say. Um, so the amount of force you can actually apply is limited by the tensile strength of the die. Graphite is great under tensile strength. So we've been doing it, for example, 4,000 pounds is comfortable with for now, that might be going up in the future, and then it equals about 39 megapascals of pressure, so quite a considerable amount of encouragement to uh, densification. And this could also, and, and has been just used as a, as a high temperature vacuum furnace, so long as you have a compatible crucible material. 
Um, and before you all start asking if you can compress things, the most important thing that we discovered is that material compatibility with, with graphite and reducing environments should be verified uh, before pressing. There's been quite a few lessons learned in terms of interactions with the dyes, as well as, you know, you know, something that emits oxygen, you're no longer maintaining your vacuum, and you could well damage that that tungsten mesh furnace. Um, those are that's kind of just a brief overview of, of the new XRD and of the, the hot uni actual press that have been adapted and required for this project. I don't, I don't have a, a whole lot more to say, but thank you.